Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. And uh, I'm C.R. Wiley, and I'm flying today without a parachute. I've got no net beneath me as I, you know, walk on this tightrope because our tech assistant, my son, uh, just had a baby. His wife did. He was, uh, of course, involved with the process. But <laughs> anyway, uh, I am now a grandfather uh, in the eyes of everyone. I've considered myself a grandfather since I got the news that uh, my daughter-in-law was expecting. But uh, my daughter, my granddaughter, I should say, has entered the world, and she is now among the uh, the family. And uh, so everybody's very happy. That only happened just like a couple of hours ago. So understandably, my son said, I can't be with you today. So if there's anything that's wrong with this recording, just blame moi, me. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you're the if you're a first time listener to the show, my name is C.R. Wiley. Uh, my friends call me Chris, but I'm a pastor in the Pacific Northwest, and I serve a church in the greater Portland area. Uh, and uh, anyway, I enjoy doing that. I'm a I'm an author. I've taught philosophy. I've been a real estate investor. I've done a bunch of stuff, and I've written books. And then, anyway, enough about me at the moment. It is my day, so I'll be back to talk about the subject of the day. But why don't we go to you, Tom, and then Glenn, and then back to me. Uh, Tom Price. I teach uh, systematic theology, Christian ethics, philosophy, philosophy of religion, other things. <laughs> um, have a class coming up with the Fight, Laugh, Feast guys on Christianity and technology. Um, and a lot of people have, always, have been twisting my arm and both of them to kind of unpack more of what I'm writing about. And it started out in one direction, ended up in another, as writing often does. Um, and so just the, the short story is I'm taking a systematic theology, um, cultural analysis, um, and uh, moral theology or ethics, and bringing them together in, in a book that will be engaging specific issues of Christianity and, um, and technology. So it's going to be doing all the things we do here, but addressing particular issues similar to what we'll be getting into today, um, bringing fresh analysis on some things that haven't really been, um, much hasn't been done on, or, or if it has been done, it's not very accessible. Yeah, great stuff. Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired professor of history at Central Connecticut State University, Professor Emeritus, as they say. And... Uh, I am a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and I am working with Ken Boa at Reflections Ministries right now. Excellent stuff. Great. And uh, if listeners want to meet us in person, they will have an opportunity to do it this week. Uh, this week, the show, when this, when this episode comes out, a few days after it comes out on iTunes um, and later in the week uh, with the Fight, Laugh, Feast folks, we will be in Nashville with our friends at the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network for the big uh, conference that's going to be actually in Lebanon. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to have a live show so people will actually be able to see us in, in, you know, in person, in action. We'll be joined by George Grant. We're looking forward to being with our friend George. And we're going to be talking about uh, the, uh, the Gnosticism that uh, kind of is behind the sexual revolution and so forth. So anyway... If you uh, have not signed up uh, at, for that conference, I hope that you still can. I believe that you still can. But uh, if you haven't and you do, uh, we will see you there. If you already have signed up and are intending to go, we'll see you there as well. But uh, so that is coming up and we're excited about that. Now, another thing that we're excited about is the Davenant Hall. Uh, the Davenant Institute folks have this program called Davenant Hall. And uh, it's a marvelous program that you can learn, uh, use or participate in to learn about really the magisterial reformers, uh, church history, uh, learn, uh, you know, Latin, Greek, Hebrew languages, important uh, languages that help us to understand, you know, the writings of, you know, great and, and important and influential figures in the history of Christianity and Judaism and so forth. And uh, we'll have a link in the show notes so that you can learn more about it. But they have uh, just a number of programs, a great array of, of courses, very affordable. And uh, you'll uh, learn online uh, via Zoom. 
And uh, so consequently, uh, you'll be able to interact with the, your classmates as well as with the teacher. So check it out. Uh, I, th I think uh, you'll be impressed. You won't be disappointed. You know, anything else you guys want to add to that? I've, m I've mentioned a number of things, but there's so much more that could be said. Yeah, um, at the end of the month, the 24th, 25th, 26th, I'm going to be at a men's retreat uh, that Ken Boa is sponsoring, if you're interested. Uh, any information on that, www.kenboa, K-E-N-B-O-A dot org. All right, great. Well, let's jump into the, to the subject of the day. And uh, what I want to talk to you guys about, and, uh, you know, with the PugCast world listening in, is the metaverse. Now, what in the world is the metaverse? Well, um, I learned about it myself through an article that was published uh, by Salvo. Salvo is uh, one of the publications of the Fellowship of St. James. Another one of their publications is Touchstone, uh, Touchstone Magazine. They're great folks. I know the editors there. I know a number of the writers who write for the publications. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I, I just think it's probably the best thing out there when it comes to well, bringing people together from the different branches of the Christian world uh, to address uh, matters that we, you know, hold in common, uh, at least the Orthodox anyway. <laughs> and uh, so this, the, 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 the journal Salvo generally focuses on matters related to society, uh, science, and sex. And it's, uh, you know, sort of packaged in such a way so as to be very accessible and uh, it's, it's uh, distributed at various colleges around the United States. I think that's really the target audience is people who are studying. And uh, the, this particular article uh, is online, and uh, we'll link it. It's by Robin Phillips. Uh, it was published August 1st of this year, 2021. And the title of the article is From Augmented Reality to Metaverse. And it's uh, within the... the uh, the category of transhumanism. So they have a number of things on their blog that are categorized as transhumanism, and you'll find that there. But as I noted, we'll have the link, so it'll take you right to the, this post. But the, uh, the subtitle of the article is How Facebook is Working to Build a Digital Tower of Babel. Anyway, so what in the world are we talking about here? Well, augmented reality, one way to explain augmented reality is... Um, what you have is a uh, an interface that you can you know wear you know uh, with you wherever you go that augments the actual physical reality that we all dwell in. So there'll you know possibly with this augmented reality be you know some kind of you know um, system by which maybe you're given information about restaurants as you're walking around so that you can you know make your choices without having to you know, turn on your phone or use a laptop, you'll be able to just in kind of real time uh, interact with this information that is streaming at you that tells you about the, the physical world around you. Now, there's another level to this uh, or another layer of this. You can actually, in some sense, uh, add to that reality, uh, you know, with inserting kind of virtual or um I guess, avatars that, you know, are in that augmented reality, but are not actually physically present. So let's say, you know, uh, you know, Glenn and I are going out to, to eat and, you know, we'd like to have Tom with us, but Tom is halfway around the country. Well, in this augmented reality, Tom could be with us virtually. You know, in other words, we, you know, Glenn and I would have our glasses on and uh, we would, uh, you know, both be in our, you know, at our table and, uh, Tom would only be present to us through our glasses and our earphones, but we would able, be actually able to see Tom. No one else would be able to see Tom, but we would be able to see Tom, and Tom would be able to interact with us, uh, you know, in in live time or in, you know in that moment, rather than. Yeah, actually, Chris, I want to I, I want to modify that a little bit, okay? Because that's not it, it, my understanding. Of augmented reality is a little bit different from that. Uh, augmented re that would be just simply sort of an update of Zoom, what yeah. you're describing. Right. The way augmented reality works, think about Pokemon Go. Right, right. From a while ago, where it digitally inserts things that are not in the physical universe 
into your perception of the physical universe so that you can be walking down the street and uh, encounter a, a Pikachu or whatever other <laughs> kinds of Pokemon there are out there. That's the only one I know. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and then you, you, you catch it and all this kind of thing. I, I mean, I don't know much about Pokemon Go, but, the, but that's augmented reality where you see things that aren't actually there that are digitally inserted into your world. Yeah, that's and a, that you can interact with these in different ways. Yeah, that's a very important point. I'm glad you brought that up, Glenn. So it's kind of another layer. You know, what we have talked about up to this point is, you know, uh, augmented reality being a kind of, uh, well, a, a kind of way of bringing real things into the present or maybe information that's actually true about or at least presented to you as true about the world around you. You know, for example, in augmented reality, you know, in, in sort of maybe 1.0, you could look at, you know, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore, and there would be like little names under the heads. <laughs> so, so people who don't know who these figures are can, can see who they are. And then maybe even a little bit of a link, maybe even links to Wikipedia that would tell you about Teddy Roosevelt or something. I don't like those right. little names. You know those little names under our heads right now. Right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But it just They're doesn't really stop. Just, <laughs> that's right. I'm trying to trying to grab mine right now. But yeah. So but 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 what what you brought up uh, here, Glenn, is is really important, and that is you know what I described initially mm -hmm. was kind of a guide to the real world, or at least kind of a way of sort of bringing elements of the real world into your presence. But what you've added or noted is that what they're trying to do is even augment that further with imaginary stuff, stuff that's not real in the primary world, but is still sort of, you know, really present to you, at least through the technology. So that's, that's an important, uh, important thing. And now and where, where all this goes is what the show is about. Mm -hmm. a, a real quick question. Um, and I don't want to go down this trail too far, but just to mention it up front is, I mean, one of the things they always talk about in philosophy, when we deal with questions of existence, and, uh, you know, and essence, if you will, that the kind of the what of something and the that of something is that there are what you would call kind of to just use one set of language, kind of real existences. These would be ones that that um, we materially confront. But there are real I mean, there are legitimate cognitive um, existences, but there is long philosophical debates on how we nuance those. This just compounds those issues um, because, in a sense, they, they are virtual existences, but they are not what we would classically call real existences tied to the, the um, natural unfolding of, of the kind of original creation, if you will. And, and, um, but it becomes a question of, there are tons of potentials in creation that allow for these things to be actualized, right? So yeah. when is it good and when is it not? I mean, that is, that is maybe introducing things too early. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I do want to get to a kind of, uh, I guess, taxonomy of things that I'd like to propose and see how you guys respond to that. But I, I'd like to fill this out a little more and get into this whole you know, matter of what a metaverse is. So in this article... Um, Wikipedia is cited as a, uh, you know, a definition is provided for uh, a metaverse. So we got augmented reality, and then you kind of go on to the metaverse. So, you know, augmented reality is where it starts, but it doesn't stop there. So here is the Wikipedia definition of the metaverse. The sum of all virtual worlds, augmented reality, and the internet. Okay, so it's those three things. Uh, imagine, uh, now that's the end of the quotation. Uh, now we're back to uh, Robin Phillips. Imagine that through a convergence of virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D, 3D hologram technology, the internet becomes a place, in quotes, into which you can actually enter and have experiences. So this is almost kind of like the holodeck and Star Trek, you know, remember the new generation where you would go in and kind of enter into, you know, sort of fantasy worlds that are digitally, uh, you know, sort of uh, presented to you in, 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 in and the, in they're presented to you in such a way that it becomes very difficult to tell where does the real world end and where does this other world begin. Uh, the only way you'd find out on Star Trek is when somebody turned it off. <laughs> you would just be in this big empty space, right? 
So that, and that's the thing that, that Phillips brings up here. He says, uh, uh, imagine that the relationship between the real world and the internet becomes so porous that it is impossible to tell which is which. Now, this is not just something that is sort of like, well, isn't that interesting? A few crazy people in Silicon Valley are, you know, sort of, you know, doing more, you know, doing the, what they normally do, which is create visions for worlds that are impossible to realize. But no, there's actually a lot of money being thrown into this. And uh, there was a, uh, a, 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 an account of, uh, you know, uh, what uh, the metaverse is uh, presented in 60 Minutes. And uh, in an interview in 60 Minutes, a, a woman named Kathy Heckel, she's a, uh, the vice president at Avatar Dimension, told 60 Minutes that the metaverse is, quote, this world of infinite possibilities, infinite possibilities, uh, that uh, could compensate for the fact that right now the physical world is finite. Now that gives a lot away, <laughs> you know, just we can unpack that for the rest of the show. You know, why <laughs> would anybody want to want to pursue this vision? Well, uh, well, and then the question is, why would anyone want to pursue it uh, for practical reasons and commercially? But, you know, we could think about why would anyone want to pursue this vision spiritually or morally? Uh, but then there is, you know, it's sort of the other side of it, uh, which is, you know, the economics. And we can get into that a little bit, too. Um, well, in fact, let me just jump into that. There, there, is, there are actually uh, people who are already making money on this. So uh, Avatar, to mention, and, a, and similar companies, this is back to the article by, by Phillips, are trying to create not just a fictional world such as exists in games like Fortnite. Uh, and by the way, you know, there are guys out there who just never leave that world. It's just kind of sick. You know, they just stay in their, their houses all the time and live in a virtual reality uh, as a kind of superhero or something, I guess. Uh, let me go back to the, what he says here. But an enhanced version of the real world. See, that's the thing. That's key here. To facilitate this, the Silicon Valley-based company Upland offers an opportunity to buy digital properties that are the counterparts of, uh, to real property. Upland triggered a virtual land grab that is now attracting big investors on the assumption that once the metaverse is operative, these virtual locations will be just as important as the real world counterparts. And, and there are thousands of dollars that are being thrown into Upland so that people can, you know, it's just like, remember, remember all the people who were speculating on, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, internet addresses, you know, if I could, if I, if I had the foresight to buy, you know, CBS.com back in the day, uh, CBS, when that finally, when they finally got to the point where they said, you know, we really need to have a presence on the internet, I would have, I could have owned that, that IP address and, uh, you know, charge them, you know, tr and it, a tremendous amount of money. And there were guys that did that. And so that's, what's going on right now. People are yeah, so buying a The product. idea would be that if someone wanted to create an augmented reality world that used Newington, Connecticut, where I live right now. If someone owned Newington, Connecticut digitally, no one would be able to use it without their permission. Right, right. Okay. So the question, of course, becomes, can you actually pull this off? I right. mean, what's to prevent a software person from just copying it and, and doing it you know, that way? You, you need a whole raft of new copyright laws and, and things like that that would have to have international teeth to actually make that work. But somehow they think it's going to happen. Yeah, I guess it, it would be there. There still would need to be a physical component, which would be the servers, uh, you know, within which uh, all of uh, these people are cooperating. Because you've got to have a kind of social reality uh, that's really real in order for this virtual reality to be appealing. You know, like with Facebook, it's got three billion uh, users. So when you have that kind of you know presence, you know. Everybody just assumes that everybody else has a Facebook account and they can connect with each other and talk to each other through it. But that that so Facebook is the kind of the and, and it has a physical presence in, in, the, in the real world that makes it Facebook. So I think that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here, too. I can see yeah. you're trying to say something there, Tom. No, I'm still thinking through a few things, but keep, keep rolling. I'll see if I can't bring it to solidity. <laughs> let, let, let me give you an example. Let, let's let's use a simple one. Um, there are things like the Wii and, and other kinds of games that can put you in a virtual reality. 
you know, where you're going through. I mean, I suppose you could even do this with, you know, an Xbox or whatever, um, where you're going through a first person shooter or something like that. And with Wii U, there are actually sports, uh, probably some other ones as well. There are actually sports that you can participate in. One of the ones that I find particularly interesting is boxing. Now, <laughs> I, that is interesting. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you see where this is going? Yeah. Where they say that the, the line between virtual and real reality is going to blur? I don't think so. Because there are physical experiences you have in the real world, like getting punched in the face when you're boxing, that you're not going to get on these virtual reality things. Now, I don't care how many people you hook up to your game and who you're playing against anywhere in the world or anything like that. There's just a, there is a certain amount of, of sensation that is generated by the real world that I just don't see how, that, how you can blur that and, and any kind of virtual reality. Unless they give you some sort of body suit so that when the person hits you, you feel You're it. You're feeling that, yeah. Yeah, I do think that they're working on uh, brain interfaces. Well, that's, um, that's what I think. That's what I was thinking they were going to go, is trying to match, I mean, impact the chemistry, right, um, in, right. in such a way that you're, you're, you're simulating and, and stirring the actual result in, in the person. I mean, this is a whole question that comes up later about kind of putting the chip in the, you know, the head or however they think of it, the way of almost connecting it to, to the brain. And then the brain becomes the, the vehicle of, of, of all that. Yeah. The matrix basically. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that's it. I mean, it, there, there was a, uh, an, an earlier, uh, uh, blog post that, uh, Robin Phillips, Phillips, uh, posted, uh, just a week, the week prior and, and it, its title was we're all so, uh, cyborgs now. Um, and he was talking mostly about augmented reality there. And there are some, there's some, uh, now, of course, this is all stuff that may fail. I mean, I'm not saying that this is inevitable, but it does present us with some things to think about. Um, and he gives a, a, some interesting, uh, you know, he, t he talks about some interesting things here. Let me, let me read from this other article. Uh, so, he uh, he's, he's noting other speakers. He's talking about the Big Think Festival. I guess that's a big deal, Big Think, <laughs> some kind of technological cutting edge kind of thing. Um, speakers at the Big Think Fe Festival spoke about ways we can use technology to customize ourselves and other people. There you go. And thus redefine who we are and our relationship to the world. One researcher shared work being done on brain implants to put data directly into the brains of students to help them with memorization. Now, who could argue with that? You know, this is where it always begins. This is, you know, there's some, yeah. you know, very uh, salutary, very, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, at, particularly, particularly if you're dealing with, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the initial argument is with, you know, dementia or something like that. You know, we need yeah. to have this stuff to help people with, with Alzheimer's and stuff like that. And you're like, how can anybody be against that? Well, it's the unintended consequences. It's the, it's the sort of the, the uh, the effects or the other ways that it can be used that that you know that we're concerned about. But anyway, so uh, the, he even go, went on to say a neuroscientist spoke about his research <clears throat> to bring the sense of smell to virtual reality. Now, there's always been the joke about smell vision. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, yeah. I, how good is your television? You know, well, they're trying to make it into you know so complete that you can actually smell what you see on the. Yeah, now I'm not sure that's what you you want in many <laughs> many television <laughs> shows, but any but uh, now now what would drive all this? Well, uh, you know, Phillips gets into that. You know, it's the economic side of it. A lot of the stuff that has really driven, or a lot, of, you know, what has really driven um, the development of so much of the kind of live streaming and and just different kinds of uh, things that have gone on uh, on the internet frankly, has been pornography. People uh, been, are willing to pay, you know, good money to uh, be able to access pornography that's, you know, uh, appealing to every particular kind of, of perverse, you know, taste. And, uh, and since there's money there, you know, the guys are working hard to help, you know, make that happen. Now, 
Uh, with regard to this whole matter of, you know, augmented reality or the metaverse, he talks about this a little bit. And he says, the most immediate application for augmented reality will be advertising. Imagine Steve is driving to work and passes a billboard advertising a new dating app. He sees a picture of a 35-year-old blonde dressed in lingerie, while his colleague, Abdul, sees an olive-skinned 20-year-old wearing a headscarf. When Steve passes a fast food outlet, he sees an advertisement for a sizzling bacon, while Abdul sees one for kebabs. Now, obviously, you know, he's using Abdul and, and uh, Steve here, uh, you know, to help us see that, you know, some of the tastes are going to be, you know, deeply rooted in our cultures. But what, what advertising will, will permit you know, a, you know, augmented reality permi- uh, advertising will permit is the customization of, you know, advertising to your preferences. And imagine, uh, you know, artificial, not artificial intelligence, AI, having such a an, uh, perfect profile for each of us that, you know, it just knows, oh, Mr. Price, you know, it even addresses you. Maybe you're walking down the street, like in some science fiction movie, and, and there's this, uh, you know, sign that says, hello, Mr. Price, we uh, have exactly what you're looking for right here. Here's the, here's the book you're about to order. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't, even have to, right. <laughs> you don't even need to look it up. <laughs> right, right. Now, it gets, it gets even creepier. Yeah. Uh, and this could, be, this could be the lure that brings people in, that kind of gets them to cross the line. So Phillips goes on to say, but advertising will be just the start. Let's continue the thought experiment. When Steve arrives at home, he's greeted by his wife, Elizabeth, who appears 10 years younger than she actually is. And thanks to the algorithm in the cloud that knows what Steve wants, Elizabeth is not wearing the tired expression she normally has at the end of the day. Steve's a uh, artificial, uh, you know, his, his glasses, augmented reality glasses, deliver an improved version of his wife. Elizabeth has a gentle smile that gives an impression of complete availability. Moreover, instead of wearing the t-shirt and jeans she normally uh, changes into after work, Elizabeth is dressed in a transparent blouse and a short skirt. That night, as Steve and and Elizabeth enjoy intimacy, the algorithm adjusts Steve's perception again so that he can realize his goal of having sex with a 20-year-old Asian without even committing adultery. Now, of course, as Christians, we know that that would be adultery, but still... Uh, it's easy to see how this type of digitally enhanced reality could be pitched as therapeutic and therefore, quote, moral in the most watered down sense imaginable. So that's kind of the thing that, that could drive this, you know, getting back to my point earlier about, well, pornography. Creepy stuff, and I know it takes a little while to sink in, but I've been thinking about some implications for this kind of stuff that uh, takes it in a different direction. But is there anything you guys want to say about what, what we've uh, you know introduced so far? Well, if you introduce the idea of neural implants into this, we're creating a whole, it, it's not just perception of what you see or, or imagine or whatever. If we're talking neural implants that will well, mimic the effect of boxing or whatever, the potential for pornography goes through the ceiling. Right. Yeah, I don't know how many people would pay to get hit in the face uh, and actually feel the pain. (laughs) But the other stuff, yeah, yeah, the other stuff's in play. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it intensifies the, the, you know, the, the moral dimensions I mean, in, in extreme directions, I mean, uh, I mean, you can think of it just on the level of, you know, sin and its consequences, right? Um, and so some people may feel that because it is not real, if you will, um, but only, you know, a kind of enhanced imagination that somehow they're, they, they, they'll get, they, get a, they get to in, indulge but not have to, to have the impact in real life where they feel like it would would, um, you know, could ruin a million different things. I mean, sort of the way people, you know, move towards secrecy and internet for, for these kind of things. Um, not realizing the soul damage it, it, that's being done either way. I mean, there's that end of it. Um, then, of course, then there's, you know, a, a different aspect to it is the, the whole issue of what what you're giving yourself over to, you know, um, on the one hand, it's indulging, 
ingratiating kind of our, our vices, our sins, our lower passions. Um, and each cult, you know, um, wrapped around uh, our, our distinct kind of, you know, behaviors <laughs> um, and personality and the rest re read through the algorithms. But then there's the manipulative end. Um, first of all, getting, you know, the way in which it, it plays to those appetites. But on the other hand, all the while playing to the individual and the appetite, it, there's usually a sinister motive behind the people running it to, to enhance an enslavement to the technology and the enhancement, and then the, the larger control that goes along with it. Um, so it, is, it isn't innocent um, by any means anywhere, um, no matter how good it starts out helping to enhance, you know, someone um, maybe who, who needs you know, to hear better or, or think a little clearer or gain their memory. Yeah, I think, you know, when we, we, we you know, we've already made the connection with the, the Matrix, uh, Glenn did uh, a minute ago. Um, and in the Matrix, if you recall, uh, there was a character named Cypher who, uh, in the very first film, uh, knows, you know, exactly, you know, what is what is going on. Uh, he knows what reality is, and he knows the, that the virtual world is virtual. Nevertheless, he, cho he chooses to you know, side with the virtual world because he loses his confidence in or faith in or desire to live in the real world because it's just so ugly you know, in the matri you know, outside the matrix. Um, and you got to wonder you know, whether or not people will make that choice. But to make things even, I guess, more bleak or bleaker, um, when we lose our uh, ability to consider, uh, you know, reality as real as such, when, you know, the worlds that, you know, we see this going on all the time already, you know, when we, when we play the games with, say, you know, sex and identity, uh, when we have, you know, men pretending to be women and women pretending to be men and and requiring all the rest of us to go along with their, with their, you know, fantasy, their virtual reality. Um, that's, I think, uh, in play here. I, I think that if we have a genuinely uh, porous and convincing, you know, you know, sort of uh, blending of the virtual and the real, I think that people will lose touch with the real. I think that they will actually consider this to be just sort of a larger reality, a metaverse. I think that's the it. I think that's what the metaverse is about. Um, yeah. and, and it may be that the first step to getting people to believe that is to break down their belief in reality itself, as you pointed out with transgender and things like that. When you once you break down that belief, maybe it becomes easier to buy into the notion that the metaverse is is equally real. Right. The pla right. Yeah, and the plasticity see. of nature, it, it just basically being raw stuff that can be be shaped, formed, potential that can be actualized in any direction. Um, and the only limit is the limits we place place on on it, not anything else. <clears throat> yeah, when we, and when we think of ourselves as just simply consciousness, not embodied creatures, but just simply consciousness, you know, you know, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, what we, you know, this is the legacy of modernity, you know, uh, when I think therefore I am, we retreat into consciousness. You know, when we, when we take that, we, we make that move that Descartes made, uh, obviously he didn't foresee all the ways that this could go awry, but, but it doesn't mean it won't. And then, and we are there, uh, people really do believe consciousness is, is, is really what existence is about, you know, sort of, um, uh, and that, and that that's the most important thing. So the difference between say atoms and bits, I think, will become less and less significant for people. You know, atoms we're talking about the physical world, but when we're but bits well, we're talking about right. the component parts of a, of a virtual world. That, that's right. And you see, you see. I mean, I know that. I mean, theological shifts in the West. I mean, you really see this this move um, as as you you see conceptions of god change that uh, we've talked about voluntarism and the whole history going on there eventually nature um, becomes uh, you know basically seen as a machine um, and this is what becomes a problem for any kind of intervention that somehow god has to jump in and f fix the gaps you know not you know completely foreign to the classical ways of thinking christian ways of thinking um, and even Christians start embracing this. And so all of a sudden, do we need a ghost in the machine? 
And so what you do is you have, you, you know, your raw naturalism who, who has completely lost sight of the whole question of existence. It's kind of, it's just blurred to them. They, they blur essence, natures into existence. Um, but the other problem that you have going on there is sort of consciousness becomes an epiphenomena at most of, of, of the machine or the flip side. Um, the machine is sort of an epiphenomena of, of the ghost, right? Um, that's Descartes. So, and the ghost somehow transcends the natural and allows us to be free in relationship so we can manipulate that raw material as we see fit or flip it. The alternative is um, we're determined by that nature and the only way we can somehow shape our later evolution is by also harnessing how we, we, we um, ad adjust our minds to, to the environment so that we can somehow direct our evolution. So either way, you end up with, with nature being very pliable and a servant of our radical interests rather than a robust gift um, that can be cultivated the right way um, without having to end up in, in, in bad places of curiosity. Right, right. Yeah, I want to propose a way of kind of, uh, of working with this or thinking about this. Um, you know, when we think about the physical world, uh, traditionally uh, within Western classical, you know, you know sort of uh, uh, philosophy, you know, we think about the physical world being ordered by the metaphysic. You know, there's something metaphysical that orders it. So there's a kind of hierarchy here where we say, uh, the unseen is more real than the seen in the sense that it's the enduring thing and the physical world is in a kind of flux coming into form, going out of form, coming into being, going out of being, that kind of thing. But you've got permanence that you have this, this, this layer that's being uh, in some sense shaped. That's why we talk about the metaphysical world being the world of forms. And then we have the things that are being informed or formed. But with the metaverse, you know, when you take a look at, you know, this, this way of thinking, you know, what you have beneath the physical world and Plato's mind is, is, you know, I'm thinking in particular is the arts, you know, you have the things that we make. So in Plato's mind, you know, reality worked most real or maybe the best way to put it would be reality, something that's based on it and is somehow less real. And then you had, you know, human, pro you know, products that are even more unreal. <laughs> now, what we have, have, what we see happening here is, you know, we've, we've lost metaphysics. People don't think about the, those permanent, you know, uh, unseen things anymore. All we have is a physical world. And then we have the meta, the metaverse, which moves into this position and replaces metaphysics. So metaverse kind of uh, replacing metaphysics. So the arts, you know, what we make, poesis says, you know, uh, Carl Truman notes in his book on the rise and triumph of the modern self. The poesis is, is where, you know, we live now and we think of uh, ourselves as being like gods, kind of making ourselves. Uh, in, and, the, and there's really nothing uh, permanent uh, that, that is above that uh, restrains us. Everything just becomes an engineering problem at that point. And yeah, consciousness is, is where mm -hmm. we are. Um, and, I mean, another way of saying the same thing um, that m maybe people will um, will have taken for granted, and I think most of us do. I mean, I hear all the time from from um, the empiricists in the world um, that that all there is is nature. Nature is just a brute fact. It is, and they, it never it it never presses in on them the most fantastic aspect of that very statement. It, nature, or natural order, or whatever it is, they don't realize that there is no, there, there is no immediate relationship to nature. Nature is mediated through existence, which is that permanent thing. Put your finger on existence. You can't. You can only put your finger on existing things. They're mediated by their being. You encounter their being. You don't encounter them first. Their being, right? And so... Uh, existence is there's nothing natural about existence it's a supernatural it's a supernatural universe period um yeah all the way uh, down the only all way, the way down it's supernatural yeah. all the way down you have there is no nature apart from its mediation through being and being most certainly is not it's it's an act the act of being the precondition for anything at all existence 
The act of being is the precondition for any natural thing. Period. It's a supernatural universe. Period. Um, so, so there is no pure access to nature. It's always mediated through being. This is what I think starts to get radically blurred when we move into this, this virtual reality because you're starting to exactly say flip it to where, where you're, you're, you're moving further from th the wrongheaded assumption already that we have immediate access to nature um, to where we can therefore, because there is no mediation through the supernatural, we can play with it as we see fit. It, therefore, it doesn't have a form or a finality. And therefore, we start tinkering as though we are <laughs> gods and uh, we start to, to form, you know, our own Babel, if you will. I mean, this is, this is clearly... Well, that, that, yeah, that's the yeah. subtitle of the, yeah. of the original article. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I'll, go, I'll take this in a bit of a different direction. Um, once you lose the transcendent, once you lose God, once you assume God isn't there, what happens? Well, Romans tells us you worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And that leads you to the next step of worshiping the works of your hands, your idols. You know, I mean, in this case, it's literally, you know, when Paul's talking about it, when it's talking about it in scripture, it's literally an idol. It is something that people have made with their hands that they then bow down and worship. Now, whether they consider the idol a, a god in itself or a representation of God, it doesn't really matter. And, and there's a big debate over that particular issue. Although I will tell you that when I was in Mongolia, you really don't understand idolatry until you see people bringing offerings to a statue. Okay, yeah, I, I, at least I didn't. I mean, that was at the point at which I, I really got it and really kind of creeped me out. But what we're seeing here with this entire idea of a metaverse is we're taking the works of somebody's, well, hand or mind and substituting it for what is, what has been created. And when you add into that, to go to the topic we'll be talking about at the FLF conference, when you, go, when you add to that the sort of neo-Gnosticism that we're living in, that what is real is fundamentally what I perceive, what I feel, what I choose to believe, if that is what is the base of reality, then if you decide you want to live in these virtual worlds, that becomes, frankly, reality for you, and you're back to worshiping and serving the works of our hands. Yeah, you, you, you're anticipating where I want to take this next, Glenn, and, and, and uh, I'd like to, to build on that. Um, there was another link in that article uh, to, to something published in The American Thinker. The American Thinker is a great uh, publication. Uh, I encourage people to check it out. But uh, that the link went to an article by a guy named Joe Allen, and it's, uh, the title of the article is Technocrats Want Us to Pray to Machines. Okay, so now let's let's imagine let's let's imagine that these guys are able, actually able to pull this off, and they've got us all kind of tied in. Now I know this is a this is a big leap. Uh, there are probably just e enormous technical problems that that could prevent this or would prevent this from actually occurring. But let's just, for the sake of a thought experiment, just say, okay, we all are tied into the metaverse. Now, um, what that uh, could mean in terms of, uh, you know, religious practice is enormous. Uh, he mentions a few things here that kind of uh, are, I think, the places where it could begin. But I have something I'd like to propose for our, our, our discussion of where I think it could go. So in the course of the article, uh, Alan says this, over the past few years, robotic, robotic priests have popped up in various parts of the world. In other words, now. This is something that's going on now. One of them stands in a 400-year-old Buddhist temple in Kyoto, Japan. This million-dollar monstrosity named Mindar is a silicone incarnation of the enlightened goddess Kanon. The temple's human priest defends his existence by correctly noting that secularized Buddhists have, aban have abandoned the Eightfold Path 
for more worldly endeavors. He goes on to say, this robot will never die. The monk told the enthusiastic Vox reporter, it will just keep updating itself and evolving. With AI, uh, we hope it will grow in wisdom to help people overcome the most difficult troubles. It's changing Buddhism. Okay, end of quote. This bizarre shift uh, extends across many faiths, including the Protestant re uh, retrobot, bless you too. <laughs> uh, there's actually a link here so you can go visit it. I've not, I've not done that yet. The talking Catholic icon, San Tio for sanctified <laughs> theomorphic operator, uh, a mechanical Ganesh uh, performing a t uh, RT in India, and uh, I, I think an Anaxier in China, a uh, cartoonish Buddhist monk uh, holding a touchscreen. Uh, its stated purpose is to reach out to people who are more connected to their smartphones than their inner being. <laughs> but anyway, so that's where I think it begins. But let me just sort of paint for you. Uh, some, can I, sure, can go I, ahead. Can I interrupt yeah. for a moment? Uh, the Japanese Buddhist deity canon is actually known as Kuan Yin in China. That's where they got it from. Kuan Yin is the goddess of mercy. However, the original Kuan Yin was a male. Huh. So it's now undergone a transformation <laughs> from male to female to digital. <laughs> and if that, if that is not a metaphor for our, our world, I don't know what is. It's a trans god. <laughs> by, by, by the way, for those of you who are interested in tea, there's a particular type of oolong called Ti Kuan Yin, uh, which is associated, which means literally the Iron Goddess of Mercy. Um, it's connected with a legend about one of Kuan Yin's temples, which if you're interested in, shoot me a note, I'll tell you. Okay. The Iron Goddess of Mercy. That's a great line. I mean, a great way of... De I, it's almost like a, I, I guess, a, you know, like somebody who would be like in studio wrestling, the Iron Goddess of Mercy. <laughs> but I, but anyway, let, let me just play this out a little bit. I've got a, a sort of a, a thought experiment that maybe I'll turn into a, a, a short story or a book or something. Imagine you're walking down the street. Let's say this metaverse is actualized and we're all tied into it. And as you're walking down the street, you see a, uh, an idol, a real idol, a physical you know, structure that addresses you and says, mm. uh, Glenn Sunshine, uh, we know what you want. Or I know what you want. And this god might be Jupiter, maybe some you know other god from the past, uh, Baal or whatever, uh, but uh, may actually be uh, something new, some new god that's been created. And uh, that that I hope Lynn will forgive me for this illustration. This is before you were married. <laughs> okay, this is a, this is this is a virtual reality. So so we know that you're in love with Lynn, Glenn. We can make. We we have the power to uh, bring about this this re, this uh, uh, return in uh, in regard and in affection, and literally in the metaverse that could happen because if there is this power to actually interface with a person, you could actually influence you know feelings of affection, uh, you could influence perception. Uh, when she looked at you, she could see, you know, her ideal man and not actually you. <laughs> All this kind of stuff could happen in this world. So uh, she's in the room laughing, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but but what what you could do is is you could it it, it, it would only be uh, made uh, it would only you know sort of be uh, brought about through a sacrifice of some kind. Now, what would that sacrifice be? That sacrifice uh, could be some future earning that you you know hand over to the god and say you know for the for the rest of my life ten percent of my income will be will be you know you know yours if you bring this about for me uh, that kind of thing so you end up in a, with a dynamic that that works exactly like you know people in the past believed idolatry worked except Chris you you, you actually miss the, what the real payment is okay. All you have to do is upload information to me 
do your prayer life through me, go through, do all your internet searches through me. That way I get a complete profile of everything about you, including your hidden wants and desires. And therefore I can make a lot of money selling you. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's another side. So there are, there are many ways that this could be sort of worked out uh, very profitably. Now I, I even have this idea that, that we, could be, we could find ourselves in a world where the spiritual a sort of AI power of a particular deity increases with the devotees that you know, are, mm-hmm. you know, give themselves over to it. So you, so you can end up in a world where you've got literally a kind of a virtual war going on a, on an ongoing basis between different deities. Which deity is more powerful, Facebook or MySpace? Well, yeah, Facebook won that battle. Yeah. But I think that that's, that's the kind of the thing that, you know, so the sort of my dystopian kind of, uh, you know, you know, sort of, uh, mental processes sort of take this. You could end up with a world that's sort of kind of a nightmare uh, in which, um, you know, sort of the worst of the past and the worst of the present are wedded together, you know? Anyway, if that, if that, were, if that were something that could be actualized, obviously idolatry uh, in the old sort of way of thinking is back in a new form. You know, in other words... Right. Let, let, let me toss in a sci-fi read for you, if you can find it. It's a book by Roger Zelazny. Okay. And it's called Lord of Light. Okay. And in that, what he posited is that there's some group of people in the future who, through high-tech abilities, manage to give themselves the powers of the traditional Hindu gods, okay. including the ability to do reincarnation with people. Yeah. Digitally. Yeah, well, it, um, and, there's, and the main character is the guy who becomes the Buddha to break the system. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm familiar with that author, and uh, he's a fairly significant uh, writer in the world of science fiction. But it's interesting. And, and, and liter- in, in terms of his literary quality, he's a he, his, his prose sparkles. It's really good. It, it's a very good read. Well, I, I'll, I'll definitely look it up. But I think, though, that this demonstrates that the, that the minds, you know, so much of what we see happening in tech actually was sort of, you know, conceived uh, imaginatively by science fiction writers. People who years ago would have, were dismissed as just sort of, you know, uh, lightweights in the literary world, you know, people like Asimov or Heinlein or whatever. They're, but their visions are the, are yeah. the visions. It's, they, a lot, it's a lot like they, Marvel they had Comics. A, they had you know? a prophetic <laughs> dimension, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, yeah, they're well, Arthur, Arthur, C. Mm-hmm. Arthur C. Clarke as a yeah. w- was a scientist, yeah. but the idea of of um, of uh, the what, what do they call them geo uh, yeah, stable, stationary kind of like yeah yeah geo stationary whatever the term is <laughs> he came up in a science fiction story he wrote and then the scientist said shoot we could do this that's right, that's right. you know yeah. and, um, you know and I, there's an interview with him on. Um, uh, not the B uh, that showed up in that they were recording this, which is August 30th, showed up in their their um, their feed where he is anticipating in detail a lot of the technologies we have now. But this was recorded in something like 1976. Oh, yeah. Well, if you if you if you ever see, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey, what you have are Apple tablets there. You know, mm-hmm. you know, that that film was, I think. I think it was produced in like 1969 or 1968, and there you have the, the astronauts there, uh, you know, on this you know deep space you know expedition to Jupiter, uh, and they've got you know little tablets that they're using to you know communicate with people back home on the Earth. So just yeah, you know, they were really uh, you know quite uh, you know insightful and important, far more important than people realize. But I guess you know. What you just demonstrated is that, you know, my little mental, you know, you know, mind experiment or thought experiment, you know, has already been conducted by people before the technology even got as, you know, as far along as, as ours is today. You know, the thing that worries me is the, I mean, all right, when I was at Michigan State back in the late 70s, there was a big Dungeons and Dragons scare. Yeah, I remember it. Which was centered, <laughs> actually, 
the thing that triggered it was something that happened at Michigan State while I was there. And it turns out, if you actually knew the D&D players, which I did, um, the the scare was ridiculous. It just, you know, they took the game way too seriously to do it the way the, the media said they were doing it. But that's the point. I knew guys who were just really brilliant people who told me flat out that they would rather live in the imaginary D&D world that they were playing in than in the real world. And, you know, then you, nowadays this turns in, now that was just pencil and paper role playing. Nowadays you've got all kinds of immersive uh, video games and other sorts of things. Now they're expanding it into uh, augmented reality so that you can run into this stuff as you are going out into the real world. You can continue playing your game. You can continue in it. I am worried about what this is going to do particularly to young guys who already have a tendency to be close to addicted to video games. I'm really worried about where this is going to head for them in terms of disconnecting them from reality. We live in an analog world, not a digital world. Yeah, I run across a lot of uh, young women who are wondering where all the men have gone. Well, they're in their bedrooms playing Fortnite. You know, they're out of touch with reality. They have no ability to interact with the physical world. They don't master anything outside of the digital world. Uh, you can, I can actually, I actually have a, you know, when I, when I come across some of these guys, when they do venture out of their, out of their bedrooms and their, their white pasty selves, <laughs> I can look at them in terms of just even how they handle physical objects. And I can say, you just don't know how to operate. You have zero kind of, you know, coordination. You've got very little sort of, you know, physical, you know, strength. You just, you've kind of, um, you're, you've kind of wasted away in this virtual world. Well, and I, and I think, I mean, there's, you know, tons of angles we could go into. I mean, but one is, is they also bearing most of societal heat for what's wrong with the world, being masculine, being a male. Um, it, you know, it's, it's much easier to go, go into a place where, where you can be, you know, I mean, it, what happens to a lot of kids growing up who kind of get bullied or don't fit in? They go into the imaginary, right? It's a, it's a place of, of that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean... You know, um, if we're going to disconnect, we also need to reconnect um, them. And I think that's a I think it's a huge task. And the temptation is good. I mean, the struggle is going to be harder the further this goes on. Yeah. You know, we know, you know, we live in a world where we see families uh, dissolving. More and more boys are growing up without, you know, the physical presence of, the, of their father in their lives. And a lot of these boys uh just are not uh, really, their mothers can't really control them. You know, there's really, there, there comes a point in time, I think in, for most, for most young men where they, they realize I really don't need to do what my mother tells me anymore. I can just do what I want. And she's kind of at a loss at that point. Uh, and, you know, particularly if say, you know, there are no other men or maybe there's no connection to the actual biological father because of distance or lack of interest or whatever. That, uh, you know, there's no, there's nobody to sort of like introduce them to the, to the physical world and how to, to, uh, to conduct oneself in it. Um, you know, my, you know, I, I, I've got three grown children and, uh, we were dealing with these kinds of things, uh, in a much more sort of, um, I guess, uh, nascent and undeveloped sense, you know, back 10, 15 years ago. Uh, when, you know, the internet was, was there, but not as powerfully present and ubiquitous as it is today. But even then, you know, uh, I had to have conversations with, uh, particularly my boys about the difference between reality and virtual reality, what's real and what's not. Fortunately, both my boys chose real. I remember my, my oldest son, uh, he, all of his friends were getting into an old game called Guitar Hero. I don't know if you remember that one. <laughs> I remember it. Guita yeah. yeah, Guitar Hero <laughs> would allow you to 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 kind of imagine yourself as a real rock star. You know, and, and you had to have zero zero mastery when it came to the guitar, but but you you sounded great, <laughs> right? Yeah. And my son my son said, "Well, why are these guys spending all their time pretending like they can play the guitar when they could just actually learn how to play?" Play the guitar, yeah, and that that right. was the beginning of his, you know, sort of uh, move away from that world. He was 
a young guy. I mean, he must have been maybe 13, 14 years old when he came to that conclusion. And then he became, you know, a master of the guitar. Um, and uh, he's, he's quite good. Uh, my second son, Gabe, had a similar experience, and now he's a welder and, and steel worker and furniture maker. You know, he's got a real mastery of, you know, tools in the physical world. But uh, there are boys, uh, friends that those guys had back, back in those days who didn't make that move, who to this very day are completely incompetent when it comes to getting out of that, you know, virtual world. Man. And again, all the things we're talking about are only going to make that worse. Right, right. Well, we've gotten to the point in the show where we can uh, wrap things up. As, uh, you know, the grumblers love to hear me say. I'd I'd like to point out, Chris, (laughs) I'd like to point out that at the beginning of the show, you used the takeoff airline metaphor. (laughs) Now it's time time to land. It's time to land this baby. (laughs) That was a great meme. In case you want to find that meme, just become one of the grumblers on Facebook. But uh, is there anything we want to say as we wrap up? No, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to meeting some of well, those that are going to the big event. It's going to be um, going to be fun. Come up oh, yeah. and say hello if you see us. Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> and, and by the way, our T-shirts are being produced and will be available for sale at the Fight Laugh Feast conference. Cerberus, we have the Cerberus. <laughs> I was going to say, choose your T-shirt carefully. You might cause nightmares. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But you will be able to buy the three-headed pug. <laughs> that will be there. Anyway, well, thanks a lot for listening to the Theology Pugcast. We appreciate your uh, support of the show. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in, in a little while uh, in the Nashville area. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye now.